Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I am Caleb Nauer, and we're joined here with Tassos. I identify as an ultra horn. Alexi, what's going on, my man? <laughs> hey, Caleb. How are you, man? How's it going? You like my shirt? You like my shirt? I do like your shirt. <laughs> the so... shipment finally made it. I have like a pallet outside of all these RF Elements shirts that didn't make it to the show. So, yeah. I'm yeah, the lucky we one. Took them, took them, what, three extra weeks after the show for them to finally get delivered? Yeah, so... something like that. Good job, DHL. We're very proud of the quality service you provide. So <laughs> that's our new bit when we just trash them when they would go, You've been unlicensed. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, nah, man, things are good here. Uh, I think real fall has finally set in. It is cold. It is damp. It's in the 50s, which for here is kind of chilly this early. So, I'm super excited. Going to get ready and whip up a batch of chili or something and get that jam rolling. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy that cold weather is coming here, too, so that's all good. And, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to see the season change. Like It's like two days long here. You see some colors on the trees, and everything is gone. <laughs> exactly, before the rain and swamp and cold season starts. So before we hop into this, let's throw out our call to action to our folks listening to this right now. Absolutely. Make sure you like, listen, and subscribe to our channel here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Google, Spotify, and Apple. Cool, cool. So this week, I thought we'd talk about is a conversation we saw uh, fire up on uh, one of the forums. And it was basically saying, hey, you know, we, are, we know RF Elements is great, but what about such and such horns? You know, what are the differences? So I thought we would talk about today is that not all horns are created equal. Uh, not all sectors are created equal because there's some sort of side conversations. And we've hit up a lot of these points so far, but I thought it would be good to bring focus to some of these ideas, talk about, you know, the other horns that are out there maybe maybe not call anyone out specifically but to say hey there are real differences and i think it's important that you guys understand what those are yeah definitely i mean again uh, i think you sum it up with that you know initial phrase right not all horns are created equal and uh, a lot of people you know tend to think that you know our antennas are so great just because it's a horn and that's not the case i mean that is part of it but there are many different types of horns out there right uh, ours is a scalar horn specifically um, and it, it does still take a lot of time to engineer the horn properly in order to get everything that you see from the performance out of our horn antennas at the flat gain and the balance beams and all the other stuff so it's not just because it's a horn you're going to get all that noise isolation and, and all the great things that you hear because they, they are definitely not all created equal Definitely not. And it's, you know, it's, it's really easy when a popular like ours gets product. And, you know, even though, you know, horn technology in and of itself is a very old technology, you know, but we were in the first in this industry to capitalize on it, build, design, engineer, and ship it uh, to serve the needs of your unlicensed 5 gate customers and really work this industry. So, but, you know, like any product that gets really popular, there's a lot of me too, me too's out there. And it's not just your typical sort of overseas knockoffs. You know, you always see that sort of thing, Chinese knockoffs and, yeah. They take it and make something that looks kind of identical, but it ends up being a lot lower cost and stuff. So I thought we'd point out some of those differences, but it's not just them. There's established manufacturers of you know, radio equipment and also just antennas in general that, you know, want to jump on this, this train that we fired up. So let's kind of hammer into some details when you're evaluating the differences between them. You know, what are some of the first things you look at from just even a spec sheet perspective? I know pattern pattern is probably the most obvious one you want to think about because it's like, Hey, just because it got a horn it doesn't mean you know no lobes and it's like well eh, not necessarily yeah definitely again there's you know <clears throat> we've we've mentioned it or at least i've mentioned it uh, multiple times on this show right that you know there's there is no single antenna parameter uh that you know dominates everything you know all the important parameters for good wireless need to be considered and put into the design of your antenna, right? So gain, of course, you know, customer requires a certain amount of gain based on the distances that they're trying to cover, right? But, you know, maintaining that gain across the entire spectrum is something that's really important. Again, we're in the kind of multiple in, multiple out, right? The MIMO world of communications uh, equipment today. So it's also important to preserve that good performance on both polarities or even all four if it's four by four and as you know again we, we kind of go into the future you know as as that grows it's important to have all of those parameters met 
the beam performance, the beam shape, VSWR, right? Front to back ratio, cross pole isolation. There's so many different things. And, you know, a lot of manufacturers in the past, it's getting better. Hopefully it's because of the pressure, you know, maybe that we're creating uh, when we when we design our products, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're not selling a single point. You know, people used to look for the best front to back ratio. That's all they cared about, the highest gain. That's all they cared about. We try and bring it all well balanced and in one package you know so that's really really uh you know you know four or five of the most important parameters that you should be looking at not singling out a single one but making sure that all of those parameters are sound in any antenna that you buy exactly so you know you look at the spec sheets and you're like okay let's do some actual comparisons you'll see ours very clean cut on the main low very high beam efficiency no side lobes and back lobes that's you know one of our big points that we always make all the time but you look at some of these others and you're like man you know for a horn this is this has got some wings on it so it's got some little side lobes it's got some back <laughs> lobes which you really shouldn't expect when you're looking at something like that so that's important you know if they manage to show you the beam patterns on both polarizations you know you'll yeah. see that they're not equal and that's so important in this MIMO world that we live in it is so so important that your horizontal and your vertical polarizations have very equivalent beams because otherwise you're gonna get chain mismatches janky connections none of that's cool stuff so the the flat frequency range across and the frequency range offered you know that's a really important thing people don't always think about you know our horns go from 5.1 up to either 6 gig or to 6.4 depending on which model that you're looking at um, but a lot of these don't a lot of them start topping out five eight five nine and as we start expanding into the lower six and you know those radios start coming out that's going to be a very important to consider when you're looking at you know swapping out moving across in the ecosystem um the uh, VSWR, you know, a lot of times they won't show it. They'll just say return loss, negative 30 dB, or, you know, they'll set one yeah. fixed factor, but not show you that across the whole frequency range either. So those are, those are spec sheet differentials that are really important. Um, but, you know, that doesn't always tell the whole story. I mean, you know, there's things that as a company we focus on uh, because it's what we do. You know, this is our sole job, make quality antennas, you know, and it's not just horns. We do the sectors and the other stuff and the dishes and everything. But in the end, this is what we do. We do antennas. We do it Ral. That is our focus. This is what we care about. So it's not as a me too kind of thing, or we might have a suite of 10,000 antenna products and cables and connectors and mounts and all this other sort of stuff. So, you know, it is what we do. So there's, there's that side of things. Yeah. There's, I, I think it's also important for, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, having a good product goes beyond just the product itself, right? There is a support for the product, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, directly from the company like ourselves, the way we support our product out in the open, very transparent with uh, all the issues that we've had in the past and how we resolved them. I think that's something that's extremely important as well, because, you know, you know, our product, you know, our horn has changed from day one, right? The design has changed slightly, um, you know, the, the usability of the product has changed based on all the feedback, right? So it's not always, you know, the best product out the gate, but it's, you know, I think a company's uh, ability to kind of, you know, improve that product and listen to the feedback from the users out there and put that, you know, heart and soul back into the next rev of the product. That's uh, something I think, you know, people should really look for. And, and, you know, you typically see much more support for active products, right? You know, radios and stuff like that, routers and switches, they have firmware, they have, you know, software, they have all these other things uh, that, uh, you know, let's say could go wrong. So I, I think, you know, a lot of the focus on kind of that type of support is for those products and, you know, non-active products like antennas and cables and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know that, you know, all the manufacturers really pay that much attention to trying to make it better. It's like, Hey, it's a cable. What do you want? You know? Um, so that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's something that, uh, you really, you really have to consider in an all round package for, from a manufacturer, no matter what it is they're selling. Yeah. And that's so much the specialization, the focus of what we're doing. So it's not a, like, a, Oh, we need this. Cause we really want to push this sexy product over here. You know, it's, it's what we do. So, you know, you guys tell us that, the stainless bolts need to change and stuff like that, then we do it. So some things happen quick. Some things eh, may take a little bit, but you know, <laughs> soon, uh, better late than never. I mean, yeah. Better late than <laughs> never. So, 
<laughs> okay, yeah. we're still going to say we're right, but we're going to totally change this. So, um, <laughs> but um, you know, that's important, and it's the the view towards the industry. So, like ecosystem, I think a lot of times people don't fully appreciate with the twist port setup how you know. People are like, well, we don't really change brands that much, or you know, we don't change form factors. I mean, but we see this a lot, and we 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 end up in those conversations as they're going from one manufacturer to the other, or even the same manufacturer, different form factor. You know, if you've got a horn antenna that's only built for one particular form factor, well, you know, that's great, and it might work okay in some circumstances and stuff. But you know, when this company in question might have a bit of a focus uh, issue sometimes, or you know, they EOL that one radio product line because it's a small percentage of the sales now you know none of your horns are going to work on that anymore so um or you're wanting to go next gen you know we, we've talked about this next gen upgrade to say hey all you've got to do is swap the radios you leave your horns in place and you're ready to roll so the twist port adapter gives us that flexibility to work in that ecosystem and say you know you want a next gen or you just stock out okay i cannot get this particular radio skew for several months like we've been through this year you know things have cleared up a little bit for now but you never know and it's going to be a little dodgy for probably the next what two years yeah so you know the flexibility that the twist port and our horn ecosystem gives you means that when you got to pivot you can pivot yeah, no, and I think you brought up a, a really good point that even you know I didn't really consider until until you kind of mentioned it is really the you know the 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 long term buy in from the manufacturer that you're you know buying from it's it's quite obvious that RF Elements is here to stay right and that you know the the horn technology and all this other stuff is is something that we're all in on and yeah you may have some other. You know, like I said, uh, manufacturers come around and try and let's say jump on the the bandwagon and come out with a horn. It's like, but are they really going to support it, right? I mean, if it doesn't sell, are they going to stop making it, right? So, you know, that's again something that uh, you need to consider not just the support, but like the long term support of the product being supplied. You know, because you know, as a wisp, once you kind of make that investment, you make that jump into whatever it is—a radio platform, an antenna, a router platform, a switch platform, whatever it is. You need to have some sort of security, right, from the manufacturer that you're you're investing all your time and money in and doing this stuff to make sure they're going to be there, right? That they're going to continue to support the product and evolve the product and stuff like that. Uh, so that's really something uh, something important to look at. You're right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people when they think about their deployments, especially when they start out and they're relatively young, you know, you don't think about your tower build past the construction. So you put up your tower, you put up your four APs, your eight or twelve, whatever that you do, and then be like, all right, well, this is the way that it's always going to be. You know, these antennas will always be here, these radios will all be here, and this is never going to change. But you know, and I'm the one guy or a couple guys doing this, so you know, if I do have to change something, I'll figure it out. But when you start talking about standardization of product and installation methods, when you're across hundreds of towers and yep. multiple states and stuff like that, you're bringing in remote crews or you're, you, you acquire a company and say, this is our new standard of construction. We see a lot of that where we're, you know, we have an established customer, they purchase another WISP, and then we do a lot of training with this WISP that I purchase that, hey, this is our standard we've built. I want you guys to walk them through and explain, this is why we do this. This is why we design this way. You know, because they're standardizing across the board. And if you don't know if your manufacturer is going to be supporting this product a year or two years down the road, or you can't purchase it anymore, then that makes that standardization of product and processes really difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always hard to be the new guy, also, right? I mean, again, uh, it takes a lot to kind of uh, build that trust in the user base and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's uh, you know. It's a long road. It's a long road yeah. for sure. No matter where you are in the spectrum of, you know, product that you offer. For sure. For sure. And that goes like, you know, there's always the cost question. Everybody knows cost is super important for everything, you know, obviously. But, you know, it's a lot of times we're like, well, you know, I can get these horns from Alibaba for like, you know, a quarter of the cost or, right. you know, even a, a standard established manufacturer. You know, yeah. one of the first things I say is like, look, get them. Take a look at them, you know, throw them up in the field, see the RF performance, but look at other things like, what are your mechanicals like? What are your adjustments like? What are your materials like? You know, if you do that spray foil sort of on the inside and then after a year or two that breaks down, that's no bueno, you know? That's not good. (laughs) That's not good. Or, you know, your adjustment points 
you know, seize up after a little while and you can't do anything. Or, you know, you can take a look and feel of it and be like, this thing's not going to last in the real world for a real amount of time. So, yeah. you know, that's always a really important part. And that's something, again, back to the focus where we're always improving. You know, we've, we've made modifications. You know, most of the modifications we made in the last year aren't necessarily to the RF side of things because we're solid there. But it's like, you know what? We need a bigger, stronger mount. We need to change these bowls. We yeah. want to change this adjustment system because, you know, what we have works well, but it could work better. And yeah. that's one of the goals is continuous improvement for sure. So definitely, you know, and, and all this stuff really applies to our sectors as well. So we've talked about the sectors before, but you know, our array sector is, you know, not necessarily what we're known for, but it's a really important part of our product offering. There are times where a sector makes sense. So when you're dealing again with these clients that are really spread out or they're really over a far distance, these rural areas, you're just trying to eke out as much as you can and don't necessarily need the density or the really good RF coverage from the horns. You know, these sectors do, do play a lot of sense or do, make a lot of sense excuse me and you know when we talk about swapping sectors a lot of people are like well i already got this sector and what do i need yours you know we've done so much work with these sectors to make them as efficient as you could possibly make a patch array sector so we put in things like the back shield and we've re-engineered the patches to be really high quality to give us the balanced beams as much as we can to give us the balance for the polarizations to cut the side lobes back cut the back lobes back off as much as you really can on a patch array sector so we focus a lot on quality because you know it's when you get these new radios and you move from your old school in radios or single chain or your in radio MIMO devices to these new AC unit cores or whatever cores you might be running and you're starting to move from 8x up to 10x and stuff you really need all the performance out of your sector that you can possibly get because there's no point in putting this nice fancy high-end radio on top of a really poor quality sector you know it's yeah. like putting bad tires on a sports car or bad gas it's just <laughs> you're shooting yourself in the foot some so. of it would be like putting square tires on a sports car they're so bad you <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> so or you're like, hey, I had these you know old in radios, and I was pushing 50 mags through them, and you've got goofy uh, bolt-on kits or wings welded onto the side and stuff like that, and then you put an LCU radio on there, and it does or an AX radio, and you're like, hey, it doesn't perform to these high rates. Well, it's because your antenna is not doing what it needs to do. So yeah. you know, much like all horns are not equivalent, you know, the same goes to all sectors for sure. Yeah, and that's uh, again, that's something um, that we've talked about, and and we've we've kind of seen over time, right? So we've seen the huge progression in uh, from, from the radio standpoint over time, right? From like you know Orinco cards to CB threes to now we're you know <laughs> EPMP three thousand, four thousand air fibers, and all these really cool things coming out from Amosa and and everybody else. So the radios have evolved from basically you know a you know just a standard modulating radio right to stuff with gps sync to tdma and all these these other things but antennas have pretty much stayed static right it's just been sectors and it's been the same thing the only progress we've really kind of seen in sector technology is going from single pole <laughs> to, to dual pole and now to four by four quad pole uh, antennas there really hasn't uh, been uh, been much innovation there and not uh, much a attention paid to the actual antenna itself i mean this is kind of how the whole RF armor shield thing happened, right? It's like, you know, if you didn't see it, like we saw it back then, we're like, wait a minute, you know, these, we know these antennas weren't great, but it's like people are spending money to put this aftermarket something on there, you know, to make it work the way it should work. You know, that's just, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. And uh, yeah, so as these radios have progressed and, and gotten better, specifically the higher modulation rates requiring the higher SNRs, it really required better antennas, you know, again, and fixating on all those specific things we mentioned earlier about horns still applied to sectors good front to back for co-location you know flat gain again you know across the entire spectrum so you can safely change channels and and not drop signal intensity um, having balanced beams, having both the vertical and horizontal beam pattern overlap and look the same to give you that good chain to chain performance, right? You know, good cross pole isolation that becomes more and more important as time goes on, especially as, you know, uh, modulation rates go up and stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot of these parameters that are really, really important and they've totally been ignored, uh, for the past decade plus basically. So, you know, 
it, it's good that we're we're doing something for that market, as you mentioned earlier. You know, I, I think so many people see kind of the U.S. presence of RF elements and everything on social media. They just kind of think it's a U.S. based thing, you know, and it's not. It's, there's a global market out there, right? And that global market is very price competitive, right? And you know, some of these markets are, you know five or six plus years behind, you know, where we are now, right? So they are where we were six or seven years ago, right? And, uh, you know, sector technology is just probably the better bet for them at the moment. And they're slowly, you know, learning and progressing. And they're, they're realizing that, you know, slight more investment now, you know, to have horn antennas is, is worth it for the future and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so, you know, as, as time goes on, things need to progress. And again, it's not just a radio. Everything has to follow. I mean, even at some point, pigtails and cables, right? They need to improve as well. So all these things have to be considered. Yeah, it used to be you could just get any sort of janky RF connector and cable that you needed. And now, you know, as we move to these really high end systems, it's really evident that you can't, you know, you got to focus on quality. We actually yeah. get that question a lot, you know, hey, what should we use? And there's a lot of good vendors out there for the cables. Um, the, you know, we use a lot of Shireen. Um, that's, you know, you grew up using them. I grew up using them. They made us a bunch of custom stuff in the past. They're, they're a great man. They're definitely not the only ones, you know, is, you know, get a good quality, um, cable. Don't try to save a buck there. A buck, you know, you go cheap on the cables again, it's like bad, bad shoes, bad tires and bad beds. You're just going to wreck yourself in the end. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's like kind of like one of my fears, uh, is, you know, because we're so really, you know, uh, into this industry and it staying healthy, becoming healthier and growing and stuff. I worry about these new bands like six gigahertz, right? I'm already starting to see posts with some test six gigahertz stuff on Omnis. I'm just like, ah, like, please no, please no. Let's, let's look at, you know, what, what we know, what we did in five gigahertz. And when I say we, I don't mean us RF elements. I mean, us, the WISP industry, y'all are just as important to the success uh, of everything because you're seeing the, you know, the, the methods and the right things to do and you're actually implementing them now and uh, taking more pride in what your networks are like and how they perform. And it's again, it's it's scary for me to see some of these you know, really old school, you know, techniques and, and methodologies, you know, saying, hey, well, we have brand new, you know, six gigahertz spectrum and there's no noise out there because nobody's using it yet, basically. So yeah, we could use whatever we want because noise isn't an issue. It will be. It's coming for you. It's looking for you and it will find you. So let's <laughs> let's let's build six gigahertz right from the beginning. Yes, yes. And it's, you know, we saw it happen when the DFS stuff actually opened up and got to be legal. It was so yeah. quiet. Everyone's like, sweet, you know, we've got a ton of frequency. Everything's great. And then everyone sort of did the same things they were doing before, just on lower power levels and dealing with the DFS side. And then, you know, next thing you know, it's all trash. So mm -hmm. uh, we got a ton of potential with that six gig band. We just need to do things, do things the right way. And uh, I guess the other point that you kind of mentioned that uh, was the cost, but also the ROI. Like a lot of people get hung up on cost, but they don't necessarily look at what it turns on ROI or return on investment. So let's just say you, you go from, you know, your, your janky sloppy sector to a good sector to a horn or whatever it may be. You know, if you can add, you know, you, your, your client load gets cleaner, right? Your modulations go up or you can use a smaller channel, add another access point because you split them up. You know, let's say you put five more customers on an AP, 10 more customers, whatever that may be. Look and see how quickly that pays off. And what you'll find is in a relatively short amount of time, that little bit of money that you spend up front to improve your antenna tech and everything else is going to pay off for you in spades as the years progress. Yeah, def definitely. I mean, I know, again, everybody's business models are different. It depends on what you're charging and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, an antenna isn't uh, typically the, the largest portion of your, you know, CapEx, right, for for putting up a tower or a new AP, right? So you just consider, you know, just one new customer over a few months, you know, kind of pays it all back, right? So it's worth it if you can add, you know, even 10% capacity or 10% more capacity. Um, I mean, it's it should pay off in, in no time, really. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, and I guess to wrap it up, I mean, you know, as as much as people don't really necessarily see it either, you know, these things apply to the dishes as well. You know, yeah. it's 
like I said before, you know, when we we started look, you know, when I started working here and looked at the number of ultra dishes we sold, I was blown away at how many it is. And you know, a lot of it's for point to point, but a lot of it's for those high end client connections, trying to people max those distances out, max the quality of those connections. And you know, when you're looking at dishes, it's so cheap to make just a junky rip off dish, right? It's a piece of stamp metal and a feed horn. That as long as it looks like a feed horn, a lot of people are like, yeah, that looks like a dish, and I save 40, <laughs> 50, 80 percent on the cost. I'm yeah. just going to roll with it right so unfortunately the dishes are just where it's so easy to kind of get wrecked so yeah <clears throat> and the, i mean the majority of the, the noise floor comes from basically your cpes that are out there right so that's probably the hardest thing for us to fix is because you know all these cpes nowadays are kind of integrated right so you're kind of stuck at the mercy of these really low cost you know poorly engineered uh antenna solutions that are on these integrated cpes and and, and like you said there are customers who have, you know, somehow worked it into their business models to use our ultra dish. And now we have kind of the, the lower cost starter dish uh, available out there to really start cleaning up the noise floor even more uh, by, again, having at least a well-balanced, you know, uh, thoughtful antenna on the CPE side where nowadays it's just it's pretty bad still. It's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. You know, all these things matter, and we've gotten a little preachy here, but, you know, it, it really matters, you know, not for just for us, but, you know, for, for the sake of everyone, for the sake of your business, you know, the the best way to blow yourself up you know, on these big bills as you grow is to use a low-quality antenna and just really shoot yourself in the foot in terms of what your performance can be from the, the radio perspective and everything. So, you know, not every horn you know, is the same. Not every sector is the same. Not every dish is the same. So, and you know, if you want to do some comparisons, uh, or you want to talk about what those differences are, Hey, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll have this conversation with you or whoever else you want to talk to. So, you know, we're, we're really easy to find. You can find us. Uh, we're on Facebook a lot, you know, in the various WISC groups and stuff, uh, RF elements. We have our own pages, the main page, the English page, Asia, Spanish, uh, now Africa, you know, we've got those RFE pages available for everybody. Really easy to track us down on email, Caleb at rfelements.com, toss us at rfelements.com. Hit our contact site on our website. We are we are everywhere. Everywhere. So if, you, if you got any of these questions or you want to compare these differences and get our perspective, you know, let us know. If you want to get everyone else's perspective, you know, that, that thread that was out there had a lot of people's perspective on stuff, and we like to see it, you know, the, the good stuff and the bad. If there's some conversation or you know you think we're wrong about one of these or you want to debate it hey let us know reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to have that conversation so absolutely that being said Tasso, you got anything else to share with the people today no uh it's rainy out so it's uh, kind of one of those down days and stuff like that uh getting cold out and stuff like that i'm getting excited for the future of this podcast uh you know we've reached out to a, a bunch of you and we've kind of put it out there like if you want to join the podcast please do so we've had a bunch of people respond that uh, they want to get on board so I'm, I'm looking forward to having more guests uh here in the future or or have have guests in the future on our show so that's exciting yeah let's Let's get some more viewpoints, different ways to look at stuff. And, yeah. you know, hey, we're not always right. So, nope. you know, maybe let's take a look at it from a different approach. And we learn from this, too, which is great. So, all right. Well, let's wrap it up. So, till next time, y'all. Stay horny. <laughs> Stay horny, y'all. <laughs>